Sri Vidya Upasana and Lalita Upasana. Before we proceed in detail to Lalita Sahasranama, let us look at what exactly Sri Vidya means. Sri in Sanskrit denotes prosperity. Vidya means knowledge. We can take this to refer prosperity and knowledge, which means that by learning Sri Vidya, one gains prosperity and knowledge. What is this knowledge? This knowledge is an absolute knowledge called para knowledge. I will talk about it little later. The second is the meaning of Sri Vidya's prosperity of knowledge. By knowing the ultimate para knowledge, one prospers. Where does he prosper? He prospers at Sayujya, that is at the transcendent level. Please don't be taken by some of the high sounding names. It is very simple. As and when it comes, it will become easy. The third one, knowledge of prosperity. The third meaning, that is, what exactly is prosperity is explained by this knowledge. So, this is the meaning of Sri Vidya. In effect, we can always take Sri Vidya to mean that knowledge which leads one from darkness to light, from ignorance to bliss and from the ephemeral to the transcendental. That is that which is limited to the unlimited. Now, we are talking about Vidya. When we are talking about Vidya, what is the meaning of Vidya? Vidya comes from the Sanskrit root with to know. To know from that word has come Vedas. Vedas are one of the source books of Indian philosophical thought. Many people think Vedas alone constitute the essence of Hinduism or it is the sole repository of Hindu thought, which this is incorrect. Vedas are called Sabda Pramana. In English, it can be translated under testimony. Please bear in mind, when we are translating from Sanskrit to English, the full meaning or the full import of the Sanskrit word will not come. The same word, testimony, is a very loose way of saying Shabda Pramana is that which is heard, that is being translated as Shabda. Now, apart from Vedas, there are other sources of knowledge also that constitutes Vidya. Now, as I said, what exactly is Vidya? What exactly is knowledge? Knowledge, what is what is knowledge? Knowledge is, simply put, an awareness. You have a knowledge. Whether that knowledge is correct or incorrect is a factual judgment. Whether that knowledge is right or wrong is an ethical judgment. Let me explain it. For example, you find, you look at somebody, you come across somebody, you see somebody. That is, you become aware. Then immediately you say, he is standing, he is sitting, he is speaking. See, he may be adopting any of the postures. That is a fact because it is happening. So that is called a factual knowledge. Other, as other type, where you give some value judgment, you immediately say, he is good, he is bad. So this is value judgment. So any knowledge contains two parts. One is factual and the another is ethical or judgmental. But when we are talking knowledge, what is the fundamental thing for this? That something is that aware. If you want to say something about something or somebody, first thing is it has to be there. After which you attribute, you ascribe, you say that there are certain attributes. Here attribute, I am using the term attribute. In philosophy it has more importance, it has better uh, <coughs> connotation. That is qualities. Initially you can think it as quality. You give a quality only when you are aware of the fact. So 
fundamentally knowledge as its root is simple awareness now this for this awareness to come we need at least three things what are those three things if i have to see i have a tab in front of me through which i am speaking to you so what is needed here number 1 the tab has to be present correct is is that alone enough it is not enough i have to be present for example the tab may be here and i may be sitting in the next room so i cannot see the tab in that case is that knowledge that is my being aware of the tab is not possible so what else is needed i am needed that is subject we call the tab for instance as the object so the subject and object is there right to have an awareness fundamental unit of knowledge now let us extend this logic further supposing this tab is here it is just lying in front of behind me i am alone here i am here alone is that knowledge possible it is not possible technically even for a third person to come in this room they can always come and say the tab is here by your side and you are here but how is it you are not getting the knowledge the answer is i am not seeing it i am not using it i am not perceiving it therefore to get awareness of anything what we need is the subject the object that is the perceiver and the perceived what sees and what is being seen and plus the process of seeing that is the tab is here i am here let us say i am blind can you see the tab i can't see so three things are needed that is the object the subject and the act of perception are the relationship so in modern terminology it is called s o r that is r s r o subject object relationship only with these three things are connected knowledge takes place that is cognition takes place in your brain now when you see this what happens is how do you see things how they are they are perceived through your five sense organs plus one sense organ which we call as mind in in only western system we have the five sense organs are taken into account mind is taken as something separate from the five sense organs in philosophical system the west that is so they take it but in indian system mind is also a sensory organ like your eye your ear your mouth your uh, skin all these five so this is also is the mind right with the help of your sense organ it can be a question of your seeing it you may be a question of smelling it it may be a question of hearing it may be a question of touching it all these through sensations these sensors whatever you sense they get transmitted into your brain through the synaptic gap from the nerve from axon to dendrite they go to the brain and the brain recognizes it now then it is being segregated to another area where it is being recognized as a particular uh, thing or a particular knowledge now here what happens in this type of knowledge we have to understand the real instrument is what the real instrument is the mind what is mind what is brain what is intellect what is buddhi and what is chitta these are the points which I have to clarify ourselves because as you advance in indian philosophical system especially when you are entering into sri vidya sadhana especially with lalita satsma we should be clear as to what exactly we are speaking about simply saying siddha well, nobody understand everybody says it is siddha but what exactly is siddha and what is chitta we have to differentiate let us discuss further that is what is the difference now what we have covered is what is knowledge what is awareness how three things are essential to get knowledge subject object and relationship 
and what is sri vidya this is the fundamental thing we have to understand now let us see to perceive something which we have as i said we need the mind now let us try to find out what is brain what is mind what is intellect what is buddhi and what is chitta the brain is only a physical organ right it doesn't have anything else other than until its purpose is known its functionality functionality is known only by the results it produces otherwise when somebody goes in when somebody remains in a comatose position in coma the brain is physically is there what exactly is happening we don't know okay brain but the activity of the brain is your mind that's a basic definition when the mind becomes active the neurons the cells in your brain active and they light up when they light up you start that that cognition this is mind now we have to remember when a brain receives these inputs and from the sensors it performs the function of a cpu in a computer it is just a, it just collect information it doesn't ask for anything this is the concept formation level today your science neurology is trying to find out so many ways of interpreting it our system as we go in ralita sasanama and tantra shastra we will be able to find out how easily our people have handled it so it is the mind is nothing but a cpu which contain information then when you get information in a computer what exactly do you do from the in the cpu you use the keyboard and then you create separate folders photos audio uh, then video then uh, document file then even files you have you know photos you have different types of quality jpeg then uh, jpg then yeah, png similarly you get subclass so here your intellect decides on which information number one is to be given priority this is some other implication i'll tell you so why a particular thing is given priority for example there are hundreds of things in the room where i am addressing to you but i am paying attention only to speaking to you why that is a there is a psychological reason philosophical reason is that right now let us restrict ourselves to base now when we do this the mind the intellect allocates a separate folder that is it gives two types of judgments one judgment is factual another is judgmental or ethical it says 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 if it finds it is 5 say it is incorrect one judgment that is intellect then it also gives another value judgment it is right or wrong so somebody is a murderer normally you say is uh, is um, you know he is a criminal so these sort of judgments are being by intellect which is discriminating this is loosely translated as buddhi in sanskrit but very i mean the correct definition could be buddhi is slightly more than bland intellect even though we do that because there are certain value additions were given for instance when you are giving a factual judgment a fact 2 plus 2 it is something which you are seeing concretely that is you have been taught three angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degrees there are only limited geometrical shape for example a dot then you got a circle and you got uh, a triangle then you got a square and variations of square one of the interesting things you should know some of the question there are only basically three basic shape beyond which you may not your mind may not conceive i'll come to that there is a reason for this after this but when you give a value judgment like something is good something is bad how do you go with it it's not necessary somebody should teach you it is not as though somebody has to teach you that killing is good or killing is bad certain things you do instinctively feel but for argument sake you can say these are the only learned things no 
even animals even when they start hunting they hesitate at times when they are hungry what is it that drives them to do this is an ultra uh, mechanism above intellect which chooses which directs the intellect but higher than this is chitta chitta is the individual aspect of the universal chitta that is the reality is brahman sat chit ananda sat is the state of being chit is consciousness or pure knowledge and bliss is pure ananda or bliss at the individual it is an individual chitta chitta is that knowledge which drives the buddhi to go after things or to do a certain thing in a certain way how the chitta vibrates that when you start thinking it is shaped by your karma palas the vibration that have been created either by your mind or by your action for the time being we'll restrict it to ourselves for the present birth only in general it will go to the earlier birth because the reason is i'll explain it is not very tough it doesn't it may look abstract it's not very simple what chitta is see you take this example somebody likes something somebody wants to become an engineer no you ask a child see a child is the parabrahma up to the age of see not even age up to 60 years 60 days how and if to the age of one the child constantly keeps on smiling in its sleep why because it is enjoying the supreme brahmananda that it has been one with the reality only when we start planting the ideas when the child starts interacting with the universe when it starts interacting interpreting its sensation and we teach them certain facts and we also teach them certain values the mind becomes corrupt the child or as we grow we also becomes corrupt we become happy we become sad in indian philosophy the original nature of human being is to be happy and also it is always so you are always ever happy that is your nature and you are always full in terms of knowledge much of it later now when these starts coming now when you see as the child grows when the child is hardly four or five years it develops certain tendencies other than the ones parents especially mother teaches it you observe the child it has an inkling of doing something sometimes you find some children born with a special inclination to perform certain things some people are born geniuses in mechanical skill somebody is born a genius in fine art somebody becomes a great singer somebody becomes a great writer how these things are determined by the act the results of the actions you have performed in your early life they are there are different three types of results of actions you perform one is sanjivta karma anami karma prarabdha karma of all these karma whenever you do an action it creates a yeah, energy because thoughts are nothing but the vibration the vibration that take place in your brain when your brain cells light up it is being transmitted in the form of an electrical energy and also in the form of a magnetic energy as all of you know energy can never be destroyed once it is created it is a different matter that it cannot be created as well also it can only be transformed so where do these energies go see I, what i was i have i have reached my age of 72 now from the age of 5 i have been seeing and lot of thoughts have been going in my mind and 55 years i had some thought 15 years 20 years 30 years 40 years 15 years i have been thinking see mind has been thinking constantly of so many things and its energy as you know scientifically cannot be destroyed where does that energy go where does it go secondly whenever you think of something it always creates an opposite and equal reaction in the form of a thought for example if you take a choice in life you always have your mind has a tendency to take the other choice for example if you gone to go to some place immediately the moment you decide think this you have to analyze your thing 
thinking i have to go immediately you think we should go then your mind in a split second decide in favor of one or the other this specific determination is done because of your predisposition this comes to a question of whether you have fate ruling you or are you free that is whether if everything in your life is limited or whether you are independent the answer is it is both because you are permitted only to react you don't create choice for example you respond to choices in this world at any given point of time any action which you take is limited to x number of choices but after some time if you look at it you had x plus 10 choices also would have come to your notice so you are free to the extent that the number of choices you are free to choose among the number of choices presented to you but you are not free to know all the choices that is a free will is there and also there is determination now when your mind now coming back to chitta chitta because of the energy it creates it has a tendency to go after certain things and it keeps on keeps on going after the senses and it goes in different direction so it modifies it modifies the things which you see therefore the effort is to quell the mind yoga chitta vritti nirodha the purpose of yoga is quell the modification that is the modification this the cessation of the modification of chitta is called yoga yoga means union union of individual self to the supreme self that is jiva atma to paramatma so this is how your mind perceives and one more important before i proceed to the next point when you perceive anything you would always observe that you always operate under a handicap which people forget your mind is shackled or you are conditioned by two things in your mind one is the space and the concept of space and another is the concept of time these are the two goggles through which you perceive the whole world and think for example you try to think whether it is possible for you to do something without reference to space or time whether you can write something without reference to space or time we go to such an extent whether you are in a position to think of something without reference to space and time okay till now what we have done is what is sri vidya and what is knowledge the what is the process of knowledge and what exactly is mind intellect buddhi and chitta before i proceed further if you have any doubt please let me know so we will start going one by one step by step i will explain any other question if i don't remember if you don't remember anything you can always pose this question in the whatsapp group one by one i can ask you mr stanley any doubt or i and also you can tell me whether i am going fast or slow whether the methodology methodology is okay whether any technical problem in terms of audio you can yes mr stanley anything else you have been able to follow so far yeah yes sir very clear and uh, really nice sir and yeah, oh, i am okay. really enjoying it thank okay. you okay yes mr prathush singh any doubt any questions any clarifications uh nothing all is very clear okay it's uh, just one query so chitta is nothing but a memory ha huh? chitta is nothing but a memory is that correct no slightly more than that see as i said in the initial stages uh, see when you translate from sanskrit to english is very difficult see normally we believe in translating everything into english i think there is one of the failings we indians have in the sense that when you say dharma people have to say it is called righteousness dharma is definitely more than righteousness right don't you agree being self righteous is not being dharmic right in fact being self righteous is a negative concept right similarly disposition is something that more than memory because 
if you are talking about memory then your memory doesn't recollect what had happened to you here about 20 years back right if it is so but what is driving you is something the accumulation of the vasana i will use the term little later now i am slowly taking you immediately i start taking vasanas then you get confused what is that smell what is that vasana you know people may know so i use that okay now i want to familiarize you with the initial thought so that as we go by uh, i think we can go to the uh, thought uh, but it is uh, to answer your question directly uh, chitta is more than memory but it includes memory okay but memory does not include chitta chitta includes memory as well right people without memory exist because of chitta now you understood the difference people who are in coma without memory without sensation they also have chitta that even physical reactions prove that uh, any other question yes uh, who is left anandi any question any question hello i think you have muted yeah anandi any questions any doubts probably okay then shalini any doubts is it clear no no yes sir very clear sir you been able I to i just said chitta chitta is mind which encompasses all the other you know the chitta. emotions feelings memories and everything yeah, yeah. on slightly a slight thing <coughs> it is higher than mind it is not mind it includes mind higher than mind so in sanskrit we have to be very careful because chitta is higher see mind is included in chitta that is chitta directs the mind it is just like a principal directing a, a school teacher okay so it is on a higher pedestal okay it's all abstracted it will come here in essence what you say is right now <coughs> let me <coughs> next now this knowledge which is conditioned which is dependent which is not absolute how because whatever i come to know is only conditional it is determined by number one the external factors number two the perception i make which is again not in my hands so everything we learn is condition and they are related to by the cause and relationship this i will explain so everything you know is not 100% correct everything is determined by lot of other things for instance if you i'll give you an example this will also give you an example of what space and time performed in our life every day now all of you might be watching ipl when you are watching ipl supposing some batsman is given out so when the drs is given you watch from one from when you saw this when you see that the earlier time when you saw that batsman was out but when it is seen from the other angle he remains not out and the umpire gives not out now what exactly do you mean by this because the perception what we perceive is only conditional we see only one aspect of reality what we see is not what is out there we see certain things on two factors based on a thing which is outside us how it presents to ourselves we see just like in a tv if you sit in one angle in watch a cricket match in that angle when the camera picks up what is that angle we don't we know the other angle we do not know so how the reality presents ourselves is one factor second is how you perceive because of our conditions right you sometimes see today quantum proves in quantum mechanics when you perceive a thing you alter the reality the thing itself and the thing also changes you the atom configuration disturbed at the individual the subject who sees it and the object which is being perceived so when when we do not understand things as they are we do not understand right this is as far as the object presenting ourselves 
Now just to extend a little further. In life, you never know any fact. It may sound nonsensical even, but what you perceive or what you see as a fact is only an impression of what you have seen. You follow? There is a difference. What you see as an impression is determined by your mental state at that time and the pressures you are and what is is building. So what you see is only an aspect of reality and also an impression of what is out there. In real, what exactly is out there, we do not know. Let me give an example. You see a flower in front of you, you call it a rose. Now you call it as a rose, as a rose. Now, you remove that rose color, would you still call it as a rose? Yes, because there are black roses. Okay. You remove all the colors, would there still be... So you remove the aspect of, uh, attribute of reality, rose, but still you continue to call it as rose. Now I'll put it in a easy to follow. At the age of 10, I was totally, totally different in physics, in physics, in mental thought, the way I behaved, how, how I interacted. At the age of 10, including my face, hair, everything, my attitude, behavior, everything, I changed. At the age of 25, 30, 35, 40, 50, 55, 60, 70. Now, this has no relation to what I was about throughout my life. Yet, people still call me as Raman. How is it possible? My name, my face doesn't look the same as it was. My thought doesn't look the same at all. Thoughts do not, uh, do not represent myself. There is a change. The way I behave is different. Then how do you call it? Still we call it. Now I'll quote an example. Then it will finish. Then we will go to say with the direct. There is a beautiful argument between Adi Sankaracharya. That is this sect. And also Buddhism. See the difference between Adi Sankaracharya, system Advaita and the uh, Buddhism is totally diametrically 180 degrees opposition. Buddhism says change alone is permanent. Har Shankaracharya says everything is per- only change doesn't exist, only permanent. That reality alone exists. It's totally opposite in you. Now Buddhists want to corner Acharya and then they ask him one second. They light a candle in front of him, tell him Ajari was seeing the candle when they light. It gives light. It actually lights up the room. It loses energy. When something, many people think it didn't, do not know all these intricacies. We know that when the light burned, it burnt light energy. Today people think our luminescence only we people, Westerners have found it. No, it is there in our ancient texts also. So this is an example. The energy it has spent and the candlestick has melted, everything has come down. Now, Acharya, will you not agree that the candle which you have seen a few minutes earlier is not the same as the candle which you are seeing? Then Acharya says, is 100% right. Then he says, Buddha says, exactly that is our system. Change alone is real. There is nothing but change in this world. You think this argument is final? Shankaracharya replies, that is the reason he is called as this intellectual giant. He replies 100% what he says is true. But I have a small doubt. If everything is changing, if everything has changed, by reference to which do you say that there is a change. That is, unless you have some frame of reference which is fixed, you can never say that it has changed because something is permanent. Some things are changing. Only when there is something permanent is there, you can observe the changes. So, Brahman is Nitya, the world is Anitya, it is only an apparent. Therefore, permanence alone is real, change is unreal. Now we will go to little later on Advaita when we discuss that angle also I will give you. Now, this knowledge, what we perceive through the sense organs, 
which is limited by the concept of space and time and also by samskaras our vasanas is transitory this is temporary this is not perfect we do not know the real nature of things if knowledge is what we acquire this way is perfect why do we keep on revising we are updating our knowledge because when you say that i have found out certain things okay knowledge gains no today what do you say knowledge it is very difficult to do everything because simple reason is scientists do not admit it because you do not know the nature is not bound to reveal its nature to everyone your time in the world is hardly even not even a flicker of a second when you refer to say for example a mountain or a rock you know one of the oldest rock formation in india the whole world is the western ghat and the deccan plateau and in term they are millions of years old everybody says they are uh, they they do not have they have no sense they do not like see the you know uh, the mountains they do not have life stones do not have life etc hinduism never calls that hinduism never calls anything lifeless no hinduism has got one set two sets of definition only chetana achetana that which moves uh, that which has consciousness and that which does not have consciousness then that which moves and that which does not move that's all everything is life only thing is you do not have enough skills to understand it for example we have millions of bacteria swimming around us is that not a fact we don't see it do we mean to say that they don't exist because their existence is not visible to eye and sometimes they something exists in the world which is not even a fraction of existence in terms of our time calculation similarly in the time span of a rock which exists millions of years as a human being we don't even come into its purview at all so you don't exist so this sort of imperfect knowledge is called avidya nishayans basic fact now the later on because of this imperfect information you become unhappy in life you go after these uh, um, pressures of senses how i won't say you go after you go you just to seek pressure you want to enjoy them and you become attached to them you become happy or unhappy because of your mind nothing gives you happy because the mind ascribes the value for example what you have loved about 10 years back you may hate it right the things do not change but your perception changes you become unhappy why this is because of your imperfect imperfect uh antakarana that is your inner instrument namely mind which is controlled by chitta this limited knowledge is only for as people but there is the true nature of things lying behind everything which we perceive and that is called brahman the reality this is the one which has been declared by the seekers of truth they are the rishis rishis are those people who have concentrated meditated upon the inner truth and found out this is called brahman now why do should we meditate has anybody asked this question why mind because there are two ways of knowing things in western system from two points we one point we differ so two aspect we differ from western in terms of knowledge first level is that what is the source of knowledge what do we say knowledge Yes. First thing is that ex nihilo nihil put is the basic dictum in Western philosophy. That is, out of nothing, nothing comes. That is one aspect. Yes, you right. No, if there is nothing from out of nothing, nothing will come. Right? No, correct. No, it's very sensible. But again, Indian philosophy says full comes out of full. That is, out of fullness will come fullness. That is. ओम पूर्णमद पूर्णा पूर्णमुद्य पूर्ण से पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमे वशिष्य दिस् ईज फुल दट ईज फुल हाविंग टेकन फुल हाउट आफ फुल फुल रिमेन फुल मे बी यू थिंक दिस् सम नॉन्स इट इज नॉट मैंने डेलिवरी लेक्चर मैथमेटिशियन 
they started laughing then i said please wait our people doing this upanishad they were not for now lively demonstrate to right now straight for example i'll tell you i am been speaking on sri vidya for the past about 30 35 minutes right from your point of view the topic what i am going to speak out of which your knowledge is absolutely zero nil to compare to what you are hearing now probably you may know but again you don't know the same level right now whatever i know no when i am saying i it applies to you or anything you relate when i have taken everything whatever i know that full i have taken whatever i can give you in full i have ta- i have spoken to you everything because i have spoken and told you everything has my knowledge become reduced full having taken full out of full full remains full that is the brahman the reality is reflected in everything it is all pervasive it is immanent it is abstract it is the substance and substratum of everything what is the basic nature of these things that that reality that brahman is described it is not defined it is described in the form of sat that is being chit pure consciousness consciousness why pure or impure consciousness at the individual is a limited consciousness of shit ananda bliss these are the attributes of reality so when you want to know realize the parabrahman you will have to use the tools you are endowed with that is your mind and chitta as i said earlier chitta vibrate it creates a lot of <coughs> uh modification and that has to be stopped so in that process the processes are three indian systems have three sources or three methodologies one is <coughs> one methodology is by sound mantra the second is sacred geometry yantra and the third one is the co- combination of both and a certain physical aspect is called tantra mantra is the management or the understanding the sound waves now I, in the next class i'll tell you let us not confuse with mantra with alphabet this is a basic mistake we commit alphabet has nothing to do with mantras because when you translate mantra it gives you no meaning in alphabet it is not it is only a sound that gives you the effect the second is yantra you know the yal yantra sir space we are handling space in yantra then tantra tantra means that which relieves you that which gives you the uh, knowledge from the limited knowledge so these three mantra yantra and tantra all these three mantra yantra and tantra are different sources to reach the reality by meditation then you have different types of approaches depending on your disposition one is karma yoga jnana yoga bhakti yoga raj yoga is your controlling uh, regulating your mind the chitta so these three approaches four approaches have given by bhagavad gita and also as explained in bhagavad gita and the three tools mantra yantra and tantra all these are found in sri ratha sasamana three sasamana are rated to be the great among the sasamana even though hundreds of sasamana are there depending on the number of deities however these three one is ganesha ganesha sasamana and another is vishnu sasamana and the lalita sasamana these are the three sasamana which include all the three aspects in all the three aspects the presence of tantra and yantra is very clearly delineated in very clearly shown in sri lalita sasamnama whereas in vishnu sasamnama and sri ganesha sasamnama they are not explicit you will have to go after it to understand it because it is very difficult to see you will be Uh, in which here you will have a different level they will keep on explaining and uh, in vishnu sasnama it will be a mixture so that is the reason why this uh, lalita sasnama is more important for one 
to follow. Another speciality of Sri Lalita Sahasranama is that, unlike the other Sahasranama, there will be no repetition of any of the Namavali. That is, in other Sahasranama, Ru, Cha, Iti, Bodh, Bhavya, Bhavya, that is, Vishnu Sahasranama, I am also team, so you will find a lot of Buddhatma, Paramatma, Cha, Muktana, Paramatma, all these things, you know, even conjunction won't appear. One word will not appear. Lalita Sahasranama, Sri Lalita Sahasranama is the direct Sri, Sri Vidya Upasana, and it came Tantra. It has 31, it has an introduction, Purvanga, 51 slokas, and the main body, 182, which explains the thousand names. Out of this, the Purvanga 51 contains, hides, it, is, it hides the 51 Bijaksharas of Devi. Similarly, in Adit, uh, in uh, Saundari Lagari, the first 47 are written by Anand Lagari. It is believed to have been written by, composed, compiled by uh, Ganesha. And the balance, about 57, are composed by Adi Sankaracharya in all of the balance 57. That is, out of 57, you leave the last one. That is the one with more or less a Palashruti. In the 56, excepting five slokas, he has hidden the 51 Aksharas, each Akshara in certain, in each Shloka he has given. That is why Saundalagari is considered as one of the greatest Mahamantras along with Sri Lalita Sahasranama. And Lalita Sahasranama is how Lalita Sahasranama represents Sri Vidya and what exactly is Sri Vidya and what exactly are the texts one has to follow and how Lalita Sahasranama is structured and how one should study and perform the Lalita Sahasrama, we shall discuss in the next class because we have some time to question and answer. In Lalita Sahasrama, many some information I will give you. Many people today do this Lalita Sahasrama with any flowers or anything they do because they think that anything they can offer. Because when you are touching this Lalita Sahasranama, you have to follow the procedure laid by Hayagriva. This is revealed by Hayagriva, an avatar of Mahavan Vishnu, to Agastya, who is a combination of Mitra and Varuna. Right? So, a greatest saint, an avatar of Vishnu, his teaching is another one of the greatest signs, a direct uh, disciple of Shiva himself, who is the founder of the Tamil language and who is also one of the who is also one of the people who has been instrumental in writing the Agastya Vyakarana, which is not in, in Sanskrit, and who has contributed Veda Sukta, whose wife Lopa Mudra is Rishika, she has contributed Veda. So such great personalities are exchanging thought. There the procedure is very clear. How the Sri Lalita Sahasranama is to be chanted, how the pujas are to be conducted, puja is given. As per that, you are supposed to perform the puja for Lalita Devi only by these three. One is Bilva, another is uh, Lotus, another is Tulasi. Beyond this, whatever you do, it is your decision. But as far as I am concerned, if I am going by what is in the original text, I would always advise to go by the original text, which we find in Lalita. Similarly, in Lalita Sasana itself, you find all sources what the whatever authority you want to know in Lalita Sasanama, let not anybody tell you. I'll give you the translation, I'll give you the meaning. That will give you the correct path. There is no point in going outward. Because somebody has given you a very good reference. That book, that's uh, this uh, uh, commentary, is given to Saubhagya Bhaskaram. This is one of the best commentaries written by Bhaskar Raya. I'll tell you how great he was. And that is the basis on which I'll be delivering my lecture. I do not take a normal, uh, I mean, uh, the regular translations, no. This is the authenticated uh, uh, commentary by Sri Bhaskar Raya. He was born in 1685 or uh, 1690. He lived about 70, 80 years. And he is one of the greatest uh, Sri Vidya Upasaya. He has written more than 40 works. And um, 
I will narrate about him also. Then the probably in the next class also, I will complete the introduction part in detail with all those things taken together and what is Brahma Vidya and what is Sri Vidya, how one has to go about it. And later, if she permits, I think possibly it will happen. We will do that in the third class onward. We will directly go into the Purvanga portion of Sri Larita Sasanama. Now, I would like to oh, open the floor for you. You can give me the any doubts or questions you can ask me. Any doubts? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Shalini, any doubts? Uh, uh, sir, when you explain it, you know, sir, thank you so much. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a doubt. Um, you said Lalita Sarsanama represents uh, Sri Vidya. Hmm. So, obviously, that is part of the, you know, hmm. Sri Vidya Upasana, everything, isn't hmm. it? And even the Soundarya Lahiri also represents Sri Vidya Upasana? Lahiri. Yes, but not to this section. Uh-huh. But in the meanwhile, sorry, I, I mean, sorry, it's, I was about to tell you, since the ladies are present, uh, since I'm, we are talking about like, Sri Vidya, I request the ladies for those five days, please refrain from attending the class. Just to give me a message, I may not be able to attend for five days. So that, uh, this is a very Sri, difficult Upasana and I will never take chances with Sri Udya Upasana. Okay, yeah. Any other doubt, Mr. Shalini? The, you are able to yeah. follow clearly? The thoughts are clear? You've been yeah, able to follow? I'm able to understand clearly and it's really explanatory. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. learning a lot actually. So, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Pratyush? Yes, I yes, see. Sir, yeah. Everything is fine. Uh, I'm learning a lot. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Then, uh, uh, Anandi, anything else? Any doubt? Yes, you are muted. Hello? Hello? I think it is unmuted. I think it is muted. I think some... Uh, then Apurva, she is there. Apurva, any doubt? No, sir. It's very clear. It's very clear. You are able to follow? Yes, sir. Not complicated, right? In case any of you feel it's feeling little abstract or complicated, please do let me know so that I can try to make it simpler on the next class. In case you have any other doubt, please ask me. Otherwise, if you don't remember, you please uh, send me, uh, I mean, please uh, post it in the group. I'll be able to reply. And my, sometimes, my if you have any serious doubt, Sri you can always Sastrama call classes. me, excepting between... Please contact WhatsApp number plus 91-94-805-91. 538 or email ramanan50 at gmail.com In these classes, the recitation procedures along with chandas and dictation and diction and chandas will be explained and you will be attached to a WhatsApp group where the Sri Vidya Upasakas will be interacting with you and you can ask me the questions in regard to Sri Vidya Upasana and Sanatana Dharma in general. In addition to this, word to word explanation will be offered of and reference to Puranas, Itihasas and Sri Vidya Upasana will be explained in detail. 